Hi, y'all. This is Kristen Chenoweth. Hi, I'm Gloria Stefan. This is Sarah Bareilles. Hi, I'm Patty Lapone. This is Lynn Manuel Miranda. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Welcome back to an all new episode of the Theater Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Seals, and our guest is Sophia Ann Caruso, who is now on stage on the Broadways again as Marlo, the creepy, creepy child in Grey House. This show made me jump. It was scary, and it's so funny when everyone collectively goes, ah! oh, wait, we, we were scared. It's okay to laugh at ourselves now. That's cool. That's cool. It's an experience I haven't had. Uh, in in a live theater like that in a very long time. Uh, Sophia knew as a young kid that performing and being involved with art, she's a painter too, performing in art, artistry and, and I guess just art in all of its forms, it's what she had to do. She she talks about that a lot in this episode. It's just like it, she's had this calling that draws her to being an artist. And uh, make sure to check out her TikTok account because she, that's how she actually posts where she actually posts her... Her painting stuff, she, like she focuses more of her actual painting side of herself on TikTok. And something else that's really interesting is this through line of like the types of roles she gets um, going from one show to the next and just leans into all aspects of, of emotion, the good and the bad, and likes to explore it. And the bad, she says, she leaves at the theater because that's part of her character. It's not who she is. And um, but the good side, the bad side, the light side, the dark side, everything, it's all there and we all need to acknowledge it. And it's just really kind of nice to, to hear her perspective on all of this. In case you haven't heard, Instagram launched a new platform called Threads. Their answer to Twitter, I guess. I'm on there. So find me on Threads. Find me on Twitter. Find me on Instagram. Find me on Facebook. You know what you need to do. Leave a rating. Leave a review. Tell a friend. Now, everybody, please enjoy this episode with Sophia and Caruso. Here you go. One, two, three. Our guest today is a star of equal parts Broadway and TV who can be seen in the Netflix hit feature The School for Good and Evil, CBS's Evil, NBC's hit series Smash, alongside Bernadette Peters, I might add, and The Sound of Music Live, starring Carrie Underwood. Her stage credits include Beetlejuice, David Harrower's Blackbird, the David Bowie and Edna Walsh musical Lazarus, Jennifer Haley's The Nether, The Secret Life of Bees, opposite Uzo Aduba, and can now be seen creeping up the stage as Marlo in the hit Broadway play Grey House. Sophia Ann Caruso, welcome to the theater podcast. Hi, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Dude, Grey House, uh, jump scares. I've never experienced a jump scare on stage before. And we're definitely going to get into the creep of of Grey House, uh, because everyone wants to talk about that. It's a phenomenal cast, you, yourself included. But I want to back up to the beginning to start off the interview and talk about your time in Spokane, Washington, right? That's where you're from? Spokane, yes. A lot oh, of Spokane. East... My, my fault, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of East Coast uh, folks get that one a little mixed up on the cane or can. Um, Spokane, Washington, yep, that's where I was born. And... Um, my childhood was there, and then I grew up in New York City, all around New York City. So that's where it all began. I mean, you're still young, and you said your childhood was in Spokane, and then you grew up in New York. So, like, there's not a lot of time in here to do things, to do life yet. So, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm pulling your birthday from Wikipedia, if I may. You're 21 now, and... Is that is is that still accurate? Your birthday that, that hasn't is, changed. That my birthday hasn't changed. I'll be twenty two in just a few days now. Um, oh right, right. Happy early birthday. Thank you. Tell us about then in um, in Spokane. Uh, your parents were not into performing. What got you into performing? Because your dad was a golf pro, right? And mom is a jewelry store owner, or was? Yeah. So. Not a single person in my family is in the industry or has anything to do with the arts, really. Um, you know, my dad was a golfer and uh, amongst other things. Oh, I'm sorry, my French bulldog sometimes snorts. Um, I'm just going to give her oh, a what's, nudge. What's, his, what's her name? His, her? Iris. My, my French bulldog is named Iris and uh, I adopted Aww. her. She's really special. Um, yeah, so like I said, 
none of my family was in the industry and my dad golfed um, among other things and my mom owned a small antique shop with antique jewelry and, and furniture and clothes and she um she really is artistic um and she played you know jazz music in her store and my mom is the first person who ever believed in me i'll say and she let me skip Aww. school to watch films and and listen to jazz music in her store she taught me all about antiques and um and so i'd say my mom was the first person to sort of indulge and nurture um my artistic side and my dad as well he he would get out the um the home video camera and and record me singing or or talk to me give me little interviews kind of like we're doing now ever since i was super little um it was never something that I was pushed into. It's something that I always wanted for myself. Um, and my mom would drop me off at the local community theater to just, you know, sit and watch. She was friends with the with the woman who ran the place. And uh, I would just sit and watch, listen to people sing and act. And I wanted to do it for myself. Um, and so I started doing community theater. And then my first professional production was The Miracle Worker directed by Patty Duke. That was the first professional contract I had ever had. Um, and then I saw online, me personally, I saw online that there was an audition in New York City for Annie on Broadway. And I said to my mom, I really want to go. I want to I want to try. I want to do this. And she said, you know what? Let's roll the dice. What the hell? Let's go for it. So my mom and I went to New York. Um, she'd never been. It was our own little adventure. And um, I did I did a good job, I'll say. I didn't get the part. And then I saw, you know, months later, that they were doing another audition in L.A. And I said to my mom, well, if they haven't found what they're looking for, how can they say no? I want to try again. I'm going to do better this time. I'm going to get there earlier to this non-equity open call. And I want to do better. <laughs> and she said, okay, all right, let's give it one more shot. What the hell? Let's roll the dice. And so I went to L.A. Um, I scored myself a final callback in New York. Um, and again, I didn't get the job. But Bernie Telsey, um, I'll give him also a lot of credit. One of the first people, I think, to believe in me. Um, he he took uh, notice in me and, uh, you know, reached out to have me audition for a reading in New York, which I did. And I got the job. And I came to New York for about a month and with my mom anticipating leaving after that. And we just stayed. So you remember what year this was? Oh, my God. I don't know. Maybe 2010, 2011. Wow. Okay. Somewhere 13 in there. years ago. All right. Um, so you're you're not even 10 yet. No. I Yeah, I think I was about 10 um, and something like that. And my mom and I just stayed and... Um, you know, my dad held for it down in Washington and my mom stayed out here. I think they wanted, you know, I think that the best gift a parent can give or anybody can give to somebody is the opportunity to succeed. I don't think it's handing them things. I think it's um, opportunity. And, you know, I came from a small, you know, small place and um, and I didn't come from a whole lot. I didn't come from an abundance uh, of wealth or nepotism or anything like that. And so what they gave me was the greatest gift of all, which is an opportunity. And they made ends meet so that I could I could try my best. And, and they gave me a, a good shot. And I, I certainly seized that opportunity. And I worked my ass off. I, I you know started doing dance classes. I was a ballerina for a while. Um, I would train every day, you know, five, six hours a day. Um, and then after that, I would I would go and have an acting lesson. And acting was always my favorite. The ballet is uh, was kind of an asset to it that became a bigger part of my life. And that's when I went, you know, to D.C. to do Susan Stroman's Little Dancer with it's mm. my ice machine, uh, Tyler Peck and <laughs> and um, Rebecca Luker and um, you know oh, some Rebecca. some I know some wonderful legends in there. Um, and so I, I sort of nurtured all of these these things, and along the way, I was always writing, and um, and and 
and just completely embracing every side of artistry I could, acting, singing, dancing, writing, painting, um, uh, among other things, uh, improvising, whatever. So, so I did that and I, I focused, focused on these, you know, all of these artistic sides and just worked hard and eventually that, that paid off. And I, um, you know, after Little Dancer, I, I went and did The Nether, which was, I think, a huge acting breakthrough for me. It was the moment that I really realized that acting was what I wanted to do. Um, and I liked doing musicals, but what I really loved was doing plays and and, mm. and acting, and I found the most fulfillment. And then after that, I went and did Lazarus downtown. I, I think I really flourish in downtown theater. I think there's a lot of artistic freedom. and It's a little I bit think- grittier. Uh, yeah, I think so. But, you know, to bring it into Grey House, um, Grey House, when I first read it, I thought, this feels like a downtown play. And then I was like, this is epic because it's going to be on Broadway. I think it's going to I think it's going to change things. I think it's going to bring something new, something less uh, commercial. And obviously, I knew Joe from doing Blackbird. Um, and I've always been into the sort of dark interesting stuff, you know, from the nether, which is certainly one of the darkest uh, plays I've ever read um, and also done. And then, you know, to Lazarus, which also had its its dark sides and its quirks, and then to Blackbird, also very um, intimate dark play. And then um, to come to to come to Grey House after that, it felt like a, a real treat and kind of going back to something that was my favorite. Because, you know, I did, I did Beetlejuice, I did these more commercial things which are absolutely fulfilling and and beautiful and wonderful opportunities that I had and and I loved it I love every moment of my job but then to come back to something like Grey House feels really special I haven't enjoyed doing something like um like this much in a long time so it's it's really exciting and even TV too uh like School for Good and Evil like uh, next to Charlize Theron and Carrie Washington and Sophia Wiley, and you've worked next to Uzo Aduba and uh, Carrie Underwood on The Sound of Music Live, right? Like you've <laughs> you've been working next to these amazing people. Um, is this? I mean, thinking back to your time in Spokane, right? Uh, you just wanted to be. It sounds like to me, and I want to come back to the, like the dark and evil side of things, which you brought up because that that is a sort of a through line. But um, thinking back to that little girl right in Spokane and now you're about to be 22 you'll be 22 by the time this episode airs uh can you is are you where you thought you would be at this point in life or is it just like one of those holy shit kind of moments you know whenever I feel uh down or uh the industry gets tough I think about what little Sophia would have have thought of where I am today and I or, and also, you know, aside from even where I am today, just what um, I've been through to get here, I think that I could have never known. And even through all of the, the rough patches of the industry, just the ups and downs of it, the rejection, um, it's the greatest blessing because I've learned so much and it's made me the person I am today. So whenever I feel frustrated with the industry or or lacking in some way, I think about that. And, and I think it's beyond what I could have ever jumped up for myself. I remember the first time I came to New York with my mom and I was just singing and dancing down the street and looking at all the theaters and, um, and it was just, yeah, I think about her. Um, and I remember what, what I do it for and all of the young girls who come to see, you know, Beetlejuice or, or whatever it is, Grey House, um, which is cool. There's, you know, young, young girls in the cast as well to meet those mm-hmm. girls at the stage door who, you know, are exactly where I was when I, you know, first came to New York was the girl at the stage door asking for an autograph saying, you're my biggest inspiration. I want to be just like you. Um, And I was that little girl and now I am where I am. So I I treasure those moments and and fan mail and all sorts of stuff like that. It it makes me um, happy and reminds me part of what I do it for, you know. It inspires me uh, for sure and try to set a good example as much as I can um, for the girls at work. Um, we have a, a fantastic cast of kids at Grey House. I mean, their talent just exceeds what I, I you know, what I had imagined 
working with these these girls would be. I knew they were, you know, of course, Joe is going to cast only, you know, the best actors. Um, and these kids, I mean, wow, they just, I watched them grow and, and you know, their talents just expand in rehearsal. Uh, and it's it's really special to see, you know, young girls, just how I was sort of, you know, coming into their own. I really enjoy the girls in the show. Yeah, I, I enjoy everything about that show. And I mean, Laurie Metcalf is is brilliant and Tatiana Maslany and Paul Sparks and everybody else. It's this older, this, uh, I guess, established generation of talent that comes. Uh, the yin to the yang of, like you were saying, the, the children in the show hold their own. And it is truly an ensemble cast with everybody in there. And I, I absolutely love it. But I, I want to put a pin in this real quick because I love Greyhouse. I want to come back to it. And we'll dive into it. We're going to take a short break. Stay tuned for more of the episode. The through line of the dark and, and, and sinister, right? That That's going through like the roles that, that you're being uh, given is that, um, are you attracted to this stuff or is it, or sort of just like, you know, in the industry, once you're known for something, that's what they throw at you for a while. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm I'm typecast necessarily. I think that, you know, ever since I was a kid, people sort of felt that I was, um, you know, ancient and also 12 years old. Uh, and <laughs> this is what, you know, I've been told my whole life, you're an old soul, like you're, you have this sort of, um, you know, whatever other world equality or, or this, you know, a depth or whatever. And I think that, that was true. I think often people forgot that I was a kid, um, which added a lot of pressure as a young person in the industry. But um, I think that I'm as drawn to it as it is to me. Um, and I, I do seek out um, projects. Oh, that's my uh, that's my dishwasher making that sound. Um, <laughs> I know I've got all sorts of sounds in my house right now. Um, it's almost alive, like the, the gray house is alive. Oh, so creepy. Um, yeah, I think I, I seek out these projects just as much as they seek out me. And I think that all the people I, I've come to know and work with in the industry know that this is what I'm attracted to. So when they find a script like this, they, they come to me. And and that's really an honor and special. I remember when I got the Grey House script um, through, from my agents, from Joe, I was uh, I was you know, totally thrilled. I saw it was Joe and Laurie Metcalf and I was like, that's enough. I, I hadn't even read the script. I was like, I'm sold. I'm in. I don't care what the size of the role is, whatever it is. I'm, uh, you know, I'm in, uh, on this. And I was, you know, told it was very dark. So I was like, yeah, I'm sure this is exactly what I want to do. And then I read the script. I was so in awe. Uh, so yeah, I think that I'm, I'm just as drawn to it as it is to me. I, uh, I took a camera to the, to the, the lobby of, um, of Beetlejuice when it was resurrected at the marquee. And there was somebody who told me at that point, um, Beetlejuice literally saved my life. Like they were going through their own depression. They were going through their own issues. And, and I don't think this story is uncommon at all. There's a lot of people I think that, um, can find happiness, can find delight in death in, in, um, in accepting and talking about, you know, it's a show about death. And uh, when you were when you were talking about the stage door and the little girls and, and being an inspiration to people, I think especially Beetlejuice struck a chord in a good way with so many people. So like when you're going through that experience and it's this major, huge buzz, budget musical with a phenomenal cast, um, like what kind of experience was that for you to go through that and to live this experience eight times a week of being sort of a, 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 I guess what a depressed teen with a a dead mom. Um, you have a whole great song about it. Uh, and, and dealing with that night after night. Yeah. I think what was really cool. I remember when I started working on Beetlejuice, I did all of the, the readings and labs of that. Um, when I first, you know, was told about it, I thought Beetlejuice the musical, Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, I was more, I was I curious. Same reaction. I was like, what? And then I was very curious. I was like, how are they going to do this? And obviously Alex Timbers is a fantastic director and the team was very cool. I was like, this, I think this might be really good. So I, I agreed to do uh, a workshop of it 
uh, reading, I can't remember, but what was cool is from the beginning, um, there was an interest in the story of Lydia. And in the film, you know, the Tim Burton film, there there wasn't such a, a plot line for, for her sadness. I think it was more aesthetic. Uh, and throughout developing it, I was also persistent about keeping her truthful um, to a teenage girl's experience. I was a teenage girl, um, and very much so at the time. So I was I was really concerned with it being authentic uh, and and developing it in that way. Um, and the writers, you know, all it was an all male writing team, but they were so perceptive of a lot of the things I had to say uh, about it. And I think that it developed really beautifully uh, a plot for Lydia that had you know depth uh, and fun aesthetic. You know, it's you know it's glittery, but it, it's also true. Um, and and I enjoyed doing that eight shows a week. I, I enjoyed I enjoyed doing that and always tried to keep it uh, as natural and truthful as I could. I think that Alex Brightman and, and Leslie Kritzer and Dana Steingold, uh, all of these people bring such a, a, a comedy and a glamour to the show. And I, I was so concerned with it, you know, being truthful uh, and honest. And, and certainly I would be overtaken, you know, by emotion in, in home or whatever it was. It's just, you know, me alone completely on a bare stage at the winter garden in front of how 1500 people every night mm-hmm. and, and to bear your soul in that way, um, is, is intense. It's an intense sensation, um, and beautiful and, and healing. And, and I think that it was very truthful to, um, a teenage girl's experience. And I think that's why so many girls connected to it. And so many people did, you know, I had somebody come to the stage door at gray house a few nights ago, and they said, can I show you my tattoo? And I said, well, sure, go for it. And, and <laughs> it was the first few lines of the song I sing, Invisible. And it looked like my handwriting. And I was like, that's interesting. What, you know, and he was like, it, it's your handwriting. You, I asked you, I sent you fan mail and asked you to write it down for me. And I got it tattooed on my arm. And I was like, wow, wow. that's crazy that this, you know, you know, short song at the top of the show affected so many so deeply that they want to, put it on their body permanently for the rest of their life. It was, it was very touching and moving and, and made me feel, you know, good. Um, so yeah, I think it did move a lot of people, even though it is a very glamorous, uh, camp musical. I, I was concerned with the truth of it. Um, and as I am with, with everything, you know, even something like school for good and evil, it's so camp, it's so fun. Um, but I tried to keep the story of friendship truthful. That's another thing that, is so important to teenage girls. And I think also something that I seek out and stuff I do is the connection between girlhood. Um, I think that I am such a big fan of my fans, which my demographic, you know, is teenage girls. So I want to pick work that I think that they'll, they'll relate to and and like, um, I do it for, you know, I do projects for me that I love, but I also, you know, do stuff for them too. Um, and mm-hmm. Grey House has its own version of that, you know. We're a bunch of girls in a house, you know, ranging from maybe like not, you know, I guess their characters would be like nine or ten through sixteen below me. See mm-hmm. my character something like eighteen or nineteen, something like that. Um, and yeah, there's definitely a sisterhood amongst us on stage and off stage. Um, but on stage, I think that they're the young girls who do come to see this, you know, dark and twisty play. I think really like that. So. It's it's really uh it is dark and twisty and I want to I want to ask some things that may be spoilers but not yet. Okay. Not spoilers for those who haven't seen the show. But the show um I didn't know what to expect. I knew it was creepy before I went into it. Creepy in a good way, right? And and so we show up and it's just like there's look like snot stalactites hanging from the ceiling like it's it looks organic the house the house breathes the house is alive the set is phenomenal and i guess we're there are so many discussions and even the website points you to a reddit a subreddit a re- uh, where you can join the discussion about people who are like what did i just watch what's going on and i love that, that in general the show 
ultimately, I believe, is open to interpretation of what ultim of what like the upstairs, the basement, and what the purpose of Max is um, that shows up and takes over for Raleigh, you know, um, uh, Laurie Metcalf's character. And for you, though, for you as the cast, did anybody ever tell you what exactly was going on and then said, don't tell anybody, but here's what it is? Or were you still open to your own interpretation do each of you on the cast have your own idea of what the story is i think so i think we all all have our own play that we're living in and there's intertwinings you know levi holloway the playwright was with us throughout the whole process which was absolutely amazing and such a tool um he made clear so much for me um and also left things up sort of for an interpretation of the actor which i i really I really enjoyed. I like having that freedom um, to create because that's what I do in in all aspects, whether painting or writing or acting. I think I, I create things um, and don't like to be bound to one small thing. And so I think that's part of something I really enjoyed about this process. And all of the different theories are amazing and similar to Lazarus in that way. There, those you know people and audience members had a lot of theories about what it was about. And I think it is open for interpretation. And I think there's different characters that depending on the person they follow um, throughout the play and relate to, you know, my dad saw it uh, a couple days ago. And after the show, I said, you know, what do you think? And he was sort of speechless. And the next day, I feel like we kind of had this brief conversation about having to be open to the play um, and open to the dark side. And I think people who are opposed, you know, to darkness, uh, and don't want to go there. Um, I think maybe they don't, it doesn't quite click for them immediately. But I think if you go into the show with a completely open mind, uh, everything is very clear. I think maybe Levi once said something like, I think I've read somewhere, maybe, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to misquote him, but, but then when as soon as the, the curtain comes up, everything is in front of you. You mm -hmm. just have to be open to seeing it. Um, and I think that's really true. Uh, I think that's really true. I think you just have to go in completely open to the darkness. And I remember, you know, I have this friend, China, and she was giving me a tarot reading. This was before I started. She knew nothing about the play at all. I just, you know, I had just been offered the role. And I said to her, she wanted to give me a reading. I said, well, tell me something that's guards about my new job. And she's pulling them like, wow, what, you know, what's going on? And she was like, is there something to do? Just it's, these are, this is dark, you know? And she basically told me after pulling all these cards, um, she was talking about the spiritual world. And she was saying that the cards are saying to protect myself in a way from the, the spiritual world and, and that my openness to it could be all consuming. Uh, and that was really interesting to me. And she suggested I burn a black candle at night and have some positive omens, you know, by my bed. Because <laughs> I had been having nightmares just after reading the script so many times at that point. I, I had been having nightmares. So anyways, I think that I have a fine balance of, of completely opening myself up to the darkness. But when I am at work, I'm completely present in that and, and open to it consuming me. And I think that that's such an important part of acting, but I leave it, I leave it at the theater and I, I try not to take it home with me, but I think it's wonderful for people to come to the theater and have a completely new experience. I think that's what it, a lot of what it's about to go see, to go see something, to be transported somewhere and to feel things. And I think that this type of, of darkness uh, and spiritual side is, is something people don't often open themselves up to maybe as skeptics or, or, or whatever. Um, yeah, people just don't always like to go to the dark side. And it's a place that I often go uh, for roles. Uh, it's a place that I often visit. So I'm familiar with it. And I think that's part of uh, maybe, you know, maybe part of why this was a good fit for me as a job. Well, dive into that for a second. If if you're comfortable, that you often visit the dark side. Is it is it a comfortability thing there? Because some people, some people like that type of energy and i was going to ask too if you consider yourself an empath as well but there's something yeah. en energy level there's something uh, of course like a spiritual level like you're talking about of of um connecting to different types of 
of energy and people are drawn to different types of things and different people for different reasons. And it is, is there something um, within you that you've uncovered through these roles or through your experience in life mm -hmm. that you're like, I just feel good in this space? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, you know, staying in the dark side is a comfortable place. I think that I, as a person and as an artist get, I, as a person and an artist, get uh, chronically bored, but always I'm curious. Um, and I think I understand joy. I understand all these things. But just exploring every aspect of emotion, I think, is important to me. And I don't think that it's a comfortable place for me. I think that it excites me. Um, and things that I am curious about uh, and seem to have an endless um possibility um are you know happiness is is uh, a simple emotion whatever but but exploring the side of things is i'm very curious always have been about um i think it's just something that people can't quite grasp in their psyche and and that i'm constantly trying to uh and i think that that keeps me coming back to stuff like this is just curiosity um, and knowing that I certainly won't be bored doing it. Um, right. Yeah, yeah there, it's funny you, you had said um, the other conversation with your dad the other day after seeing the show, because literally yesterday I was having a conversation with somebody about the generational differences between um, the basics around just being okay with therapy, for one, right? Like talking about your feelings and talking <laughs> about the good and the bad. And, you know, my parents are in their 70s and to admit they're wrong is like getting hit by lightning it just doesn't happen <laughs> right and and but then there's people like i'm i'm in my early 40s and i've done trying to do the work and it's it's hard and then there's people like again you're about to be 22 and uh you're it, growing up with the internet in your pocket and and not knowing the analog age uh, at all. It's just, there's a level of communication and awareness and expertise that, that I am so envious of that mm -hmm. you seem to just like you, you and your peers seem to just be able to be like, yeah, like I know there is so much more out there and I need to explore all of it. We're going to take a short break. Stay tuned for more of the episode. Being aware of the dark side, having this conversation with your dad and whatnot, is is this something that you are actively, consciously trying to um, to work with and work towards and work in with, with people that are um, maybe not big city folk, right? They're, they don't have a big experience just by situation, not by choice. Or like your parents who are... Um, not of a of a generation where they like to talk about lots of things, right? So if mm -hmm. you're interested in exploring, why the interest? Why the why the need for this? I'd say uh, I grew. I am a big feeler. I'm very emotional creature, and I I I have this little thing that I that I say and and tell my friends when they're feeling down. I say. You have 48 hours to experience this emotion to its greatest extent um, and feel it. Um, and then you let it go and then you let it pass. Because to linger hmm. in, in such uh, intense feeling uh, can be overwhelming. I would consider myself an empath, I guess. Um, maybe uh, I just am a big feeler. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I, I take on everyone's emotions. I think I have good boundaries, but I do... Um, I am a very deep feeler, and I think that comes from both of my parents. They're sensitive um, and also strong, and I think that even though their generation is different, I was, you know, raised in a way that I could talk about my feelings. Um, and I think that Gen Z, I'm a, I'm a fan of Gen Z. I think sometimes we get a bad rap, uh, but I'm a fan of Gen Z. I'm not ashamed to be Gen Z. I do know <laughs> a bit of the analog days, though, because I, you know, we got a computer when I was a kid, um, but I, you know, I was more just listening to CDs and whatever um, and painting. 
and films, which existed in the analog days, and I watched old films too, you know, so I wouldn't say that I, I only grew up with the internet in my pocket. That wasn't there until I, you know, the internet wasn't in my pocket until I was, you know, 13, which is still, you know, young. Maybe that's like around when I got Instagram. Um, and I think there is a lot of darkness on the internet uh, and, and certainly much of it to be avoided. Uh, I think it's a dangerous, yeah. the, the dark, the darkness on the internet can be a dangerous place for the youth. Uh, and I think that, um, I think that we should have a little more protection, but, um, I think there is a freedom, you know, there's a, there's a rectangle, a skinny rectangle in my back pocket that I can learn anything I really want from. Um, I think it's an amazing tool. And when used wisely, I think that there's so much to be learned. I use this app recently called i think it's called nimble or nibble mind or something like that and you can learn different things uh like I'm, I'm looking through some art history stuff i was doing a lesson on why medieval babies look so weird and i learned so much. <laughs> i didn't know they look weird why do they and look you know, weird well there's a lot of reasons that medieval babies look weird first of all the if I'm remembering right from last night, this is supposed to help you with your memory recall, which I'm working on. Um, so let me see what I can remember. But, but you can't remember what it is. No, I can remember. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll tell you. So the beauty standards were different back then. Long foreheads and, and, and basically gone eyebrows were, were in. Um, and a lot of uh, art from, from men was religious based. Uh, and you look at a picture or a, a painting, excuse me, of... The Virgin Mary and, uh, and baby Jesus, and and uh, they were giving examples of the proportions uh, and how they look strange. And I really realized because they told me this, it's not a matter of skill in in the proportions that the p painter was making. It's intentional, and so a lot of baby Jesus are they almost look like little tiny men, which relates to how they perceived Jesus uh, is like fully formed in a way. Um, like this tiny little man, uh, which was interesting that they, you know, messed with the proportions of that child that way. And also children were kept inside till they were a lot older back then. And a lot of the religious art was made by monks, you know, and whatever. And they didn't really see children at the same time. So there was all of these different factors. I guess that's what I was kind of learning about last night. And I'm sure some art historian will make a comment on that and be like, she's incorrect. But that's what I, I learned last night. Um, that's cool. I really love that you're into art history. It's, it's a oh, very, yeah. I, uh, well, I paint. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of just learning more about that all of the time. I love, I love paintings. Um, and they're, what style, what style do you paint? What do you normally like to paint? Lots of different things. I, right now I'm working on a bunch of paintings that feel very Georgia O'Keeffe, um, sort of floral and nature details that also, sort of touch on like the female body um, or create a landscape of the female body, which I think is, I'm having a lot of fun with. I'm working with lots of different mediums, oil paints, chalk pests. I just finished a painting this morning that is a mixture of watercolor, uh, acrylic, uh, chalk pastels. Um, uh, what else? I don't know. Um, and I, it's very blendy and, and cool. So I love oil paint. My mom painted when I was little. So it's something I've always enjoyed for myself, but I'd love to have a gallery at some point. I think that would be really fun. That's um, so fascinating. Yeah. It's what I, it's my, it's my meditation. If I had to say one, one mental health thing I do specifically that keeps me aligned is, is painting every morning. I you know get up and I paint. It's one of the first things I do. It's meditative. Uh, it's expressive. And, and that, is one of my favorite things to do alongside acting. That's cool. Well, you need to like get somebody to put you in a show where you're painting on stage. So you just combine everything that. all at once. I've thought about that. We actually have uh, on the set in Grey House, when we were in tech, there's this sort of wall. And Joe passed me some chalk and was like, you know, draw on there. Uh, so I sort of drew on there in the style of little kids and what our characters would kind of do. And then on top of that, the kids came over and started adding and it was so much fun to do that. I love doing that. I would love to paint on stage, but I also made Lori Metcalf a big, big painting for her dressing room. She was saying she needed more art in there. And I was like, yeah, I could, you know, I could paint you something. And she was really excited about that. So I made her this uh, gray house 
inspired painting um and it's cool it has lots of hidden messages and it's sort of a different abstract style that i hadn't tried before and i ended up it was a huge painting but i ended up making it in like two or three hours because i was just so into it um and it hangs in her dressing room um you know she said she's going to give it to her daughter to go to you know her dorm or whatever and then they're going to ship it back to la so i'm really happy that she'll you know keep it and enjoys it um because painting is such a personal a personal thing wow well thank you thank you i think that's really cool um we are coming short on time so i want to wrap up with the three questions i ask everybody just to end the episodes the first one just very simply is just what motivates you um what motivates me uh is curiosity uh i'd say and just my overall drive i think is just instinctual i love what i do so much and it keeps me going no matter how hard it gets because i love it so much i think you really have to love it uh to be in this industry uh because it can get Mm -hmm. tough at times and i think my curiosity and love for what i do is what keeps me going and my necessity i need i need to paint i need to act these are things i need and so i just have to get them just like food Mm. What advice would you give to younger people? Uh, to, sorry, what advice would you give to your younger self and younger people listening now, starting out down a similar path? For young people, you know, if you if you really love it, you can make it happen. And and just to if it's what you really want and you know it in your heart, just to not give up and keep working hard and and focus. And and you have to make sacrifices. For sure, but I'd say just never give up and keep working hard, and it will pay off. So now, if you could only see one show for the rest of your life, but you can see it as many times as you want, what would you see? <laughs> oh wow, that's a awesome question. Um, well, my gosh, right now it would be Grey House because I'm so <laughs> in it and I love exploring it every single day. Um, every single day, something new happens there's something that shifts or something i discover so it's such a complex beautiful play I, i'd say i would like to live in gray house for for quite some time uh for now have you been able to swing out and watch it in its entirety yet no no i i just don't um i i don't miss a show unless i'm i'm feeling i'm feeling really ill um and so yeah truly you know i you know, with musicals, especially, it's like it takes such a toll on the physical body. You have to take care of yourself. So I, that's the only stuff I've ever, you know, called out of was musicals. But I, I just love what I do so much and so fulfilling. And I and I would love to watch it, but I'm in it, which I feel like is uh, and I've watched so much in rehearsal. So so I feel I feel good about what I have have seen of it. And I think it might change things <laughs> if I watched it. You know, I'd be like aware of certain things that I don't want to be. Yeah aware of uh so i don't know that i would want to watch it just because i'm in it that's interesting yeah i I never thought about that That, yeah when you watch it you're going to start being aware of things you never noticed before and it takes you Mm -hmm. out i get it i get it okay so where can we find you online on social media do you you play that game i do i have social media um i've been wanting to experiment more on it uh, and show some different sides of myself Um, my instagram specifically there's you know a lot of images of me or, or whatever, the algorithm wants me to be one thing and, and I'm simply not. So I haven't been posting so much because I'm sort of scheming on how I want to present on that. But my Instagram is just my full name, at my full name. I have the TikTok, which I make little painting videos on recently. I think that's kind of fun because I never cool. know what to post on there. Um, so that's just at Sophia with a PH. And then I think my Twitter is the same as, as the Instagram, which I... I troll on sometimes just to look at stuff, but I don't. I don't tweet much. I'm more of a you know a sleuth. Yes. On Twitter. <laughs> well, Twitter's dying anyway. Um, well, now as of two days ago, you got to get on Threads. That's that's the new thing. Um, <laughs> have you heard about that? That's Instagram's answer to Twitter. Uh, I, I just joined Threads, so find me there. Uh, you can get more of me on Instagram and Twitter at theater underscore podcast, Facebook dot com slash official theater podcast. Leave a rating, leave a review, tell your friend. It helps uh, the podcast grow. Thank you to Jukebox the Ghost for the intro and outro music, and Sophia, thank you most of all for this lovely, lovely conversation. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's been super fun. Take a deep breath, make the world a little colorful.